Welcome to the masterclass that covers a ton of successful movies. Just take a look at the box office results of the past 100 years and the list of Oscar movies. Chances are that you'll find a majority of titles that are based on underlying work and most of that will be work from a different medium. We're looking at adaptations, all sorts of adaptations with a particular focus on adaptations from novel and short story. Day afternoon. Lamette's new film is one of those stunning examples of the truth being so strange it becomes super fiction. That's for everybody. Guns are down. It dramatizes a real and rather extraordinary bank robbery which took place in Brooklyn on a torrid August day in 1972. If a writer had thought up this story, it would be dismissed as too weird, too unbelievable. But it did happen in Brooklyn. No, 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 you got it wrong. He, he robbed the bank. Yeah, he, he robbed the bank because it was there. No. As well as he wanted said, for the money. a sex operation for his boyfriend. Uh, yes, it's a true story. Oh, yeah, it was a true story. Um... Why is it important to adapt? Because it appears that um, there are more adaptations hitting the screen than original works. Now, that was different at the time. Ten years ago, this chart was published. And you see 1981, there's only one adaptation that was ruling the Oscars at the time that was um, on Golden Pond. Ten years later, it seems as if adaptations had taken over. There was a majority, six adaptations out of the top ten. This is the top ten box office uh, in U.S., dollars. And then 2001 was the year of Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings. And then it had shrunk to only three adaptations. But there were only two originals left. So there's still 50% more adaptations in that top 10 than there were originals. And uh, one original was Monsters Inc. from Pixar. And Pearl Harbor, you could argue, was also somewhat of an adaptation of uh, true events. So you might recolor that title and add it to the adaptations, then you would have four out of ten. Then 2011, that there you can see how the sequels started to take over the box office. Uh, Harry Potter, what is that? Eight, Transformers, Three, Twilight, Hangover, Pirates of the Caribbean, Fast Five, Cast Two, Planet of the Apes. And then Thor and Captain America, obviously, they're both Marvel. And now Marvel is very much dominating. You could argue that that is essentially adaptation. So the Marvel Universe films are adaptations of the original comics. In that respect, you might add them to the... Um, yeah, here, actually, they are, they are listed as adaptations. I'm keen to see what 2021 is going to bring. That's the next decade, um, or, or wrapped up at, at least. I did an analysis of 2020 last year. It was a funny year, but here you see that there are two adaptations still, lots of sequels, and the originals are back. There's three originals, Onward, Tenet, and The Gentleman. Now, if that inspires you to work on original material, then be aware that those three films were essentially driven by Pixar, Christopher Nolan, and Guy Ritchie. And to go into that top 10 box office in Hollywood as a newbie with fresh material is nigh impossible. Um, now, if you look at the adaptations, Sonic the Hedgehog and Call of the Wild, one is a game adaptation and the other, the other is a Jack London um, novel adaptation. So why is it that adaptations are so powerful? First of all, I, th I think there's a sense of um, confidence. In the marketing of a film based on an adaptation, the studios or the producers can go back to the original material, and we assume that there already is a market for that original material. You know, when Harry Potter was launched in the theaters, there already were tens of millions of readers around the world, and there was guaranteed box office. 
even if you are working with relatively unknown material, because let's be honest, we do not have access to that sort of large properties. Uh, it's, that sort of material is screamed off by the studios. They have direct access to the publishers. They know what's going to be released way ahead of uh, us mere mortals. And they often also have deals with the publishers for a first, first look and a first option. So why then should we look at adaptations? Well, if something works in its own medium, you already have a story. You don't need to start from scratch. And if you're like me, you struggle to string a proper story together from scratch. Most working writers, and that's, that's one of the reasons why there are so many adaptations, it's much easier, much faster to work with an existing property than having to come up with, with one uh, uh, by itself and then go through that whole process. So the, the development work has been done to an extent. So you've got a leg up and you're basically just improving on what is there. Much of what we have access to is based in true stories in the real world. You can tell your own story, although I'm going to say something about that. Or you can just read the newspaper, uh, look at what's happening at the courts, and draw your inspiration from there. Because as you know, truth is strange. Now, fiction always has been Dog Day Afternoon is your example. And there, there is something about that label that something is a true fact or based on a true story it is appealing. It draws an audience in more than other works. When you speak with distributors, marketing people, they will tell you that true stories are an easier sell. It's the opening of Fargo, uh, a film that is anything but a true story. It is not even based on a true story. It's just a joke by the Coen brothers to add that opening title. Why? Because they can. Because it is appealing and it, it, sets us, uh, uh, it puts us in a certain frame of mind. It opens up our suspensions of disbelief, I guess. So we're, we're ma now more likely to go along with the story because it's just been told that this did happen, no matter how bizarre uh, and strange it, it may be. And, and I can guarantee you it is pretty bizarre. So what sort of source material do we have? Let's have a look at the most common stuff. Novel, obviously, is very common. Short stories stage plays, poems, news, magazine articles, songs, fairy tale, court case, you name it. Combinations of these. The, the movie adaptation is essentially a film adaptation based on a book that was based on a magazine article that was based on true facts. It's complex, and the film itself is, is quite complex. It's, it plays with all those levels in an absolute um, masterful way. So check out the, the film adaptation by Spike Jones, I think directed uh, based on a screenplay by Charlie Kaufman. And um, yeah, this is only a very limited list. If you were to sit down and brainstorm all the materials, all the types of material that you can use to build your film on, to write a screenplay from, it doesn't end. You can even go into the personal ads. This is actually an ad that triggered the film Safety Not Guaranteed. Um, it's a good film. It's different from what, it, what you might expect from this particular 
had. It is a small indie drama, but um, beautifully, beautifully done. Well, obviously, there's no rules, there's no restrictions, no limitations. You can adapt whatever you like. There are people who claim that it is much harder to adapt to your own work and therefore you should steer away from your autobiography or adaptation of your own literary work. Um, I said that in yesterday's class. Obviously, that didn't go down very well because we have a few authors there who are intending on adapting their own work, but they're paying attention and I think there's hope. This is something that Michael Haig says in his um, four rules that we'll look at. You shouldn't do your own work. Well, you know, once you're warned about the pitfalls, hopefully you can um, avoid those. Speaking of processes, how do you do this? How are you going to tackle this? There are pretty much, uh, well, actually, let's first look at the, the considerations that we take into account. Genre is one. Time frame is another concept, conflict, pacing, and fidelity. Now, fidelity is obviously the big, big, um, um, how would I say that? That's a big hurdle for many adaptors. They love the novel, or they love the, or the, the, the origin work, the source work, and they want to keep as much of the experience as possible when they go to the movie. And there's this continuum from on the left entirely not faithful to completely faithful on the right and you could say that this these four stages I borrowed this from an Australian book on adaptations where the complete freedom is called appropriation and the most faithful obviously is a faithful adaptation and then you have variation in the section in between you have high fidelity uh, at the one end, and examples may be no, no Country for Old Men, Da Vinci Code, Room for the View, and Danger Close. Uh, each in their own genre follow the original work or the true events, in the case of Danger Close, very closely. On the other hand, we have low fidelity, and you might say that most movies by Stanley Kubrick that are adapted on, from original work, uh, they're fairly loose. Same for Alfred Hitchcock. Now, Talking about Hitchcock, his approach was very simple. He says when he adapts an existing work, he will read it once, he will go to the play and watch it once, and then forget about it and build a new work from the ground up. And that brings us to another rule that you will hear later on from Michael Haig. Your allegiance is to the movie, not to the, to the original work. You have to make sure that you, ha you have the rights to adapt this and as part of these rights, you should be entitled to take a, a significant amount of freedom because ultimately you need to make the, the movie work. If it doesn't, you're going to incur a loss and um, that's not why you were hired by the producer. It doesn't very often happen that I go back to the first screenwriting book ever written in 1979 or at least the first that was widely um, uh, respected by Sid Field, screenplay. And I've got it here somewhere. If you don't already know it, this is it. And page or chapter 14 starts like this. It's about adaptation. Adapting a novel, book, play or article into a screenplay is the same as writing an original screenplay. Um, okay. That's interesting. And then why do you have a chapter on adaptation? If it's the same thing, you might just move on and do the same thing you were doing, right? On page two, he says an adaptation must be viewed as an original screenplay. It only starts from the novel, book, play, article, or song. That is the source material, the starting point, nothing more. When you adapt a novel, you are not obligated to remain faithful to the original material. Then the question, obviously, is why worry? You know, if, if the process is the same as writing a script, well, we are script writers. We know how you do that. Here is the, the tricky part. Because of our love for the original work, we are tempted into doing something differently from what we normally do. It tempts us, it blinds us, it numbs us, it, it makes us drunk and it makes us forget some of the basic rules of dramatic storytelling for the screen. Because literary works in particular have different uh, 
approaches have more freedoms. And obviously, you all know that in a book, you can describe someone's thoughts. It's much harder in film. There you wouldn't need to use narration, voiceover, for instance. In a movie, and here is a very important one, when something happens to a character, that character doesn't necessarily have to respond to that event. They can just observe it, and you can read the description of their emotions and their thoughts as a response to that event. That works perfectly fine. Many hugely successful novels use this all the time. In film, you do that, you're dead. So that's the reason why you should worry, because there is a risk that you are blinded by the style, the approach, and the differences of the original material, the differences with what you would normally do as a writer. That's the reason why we should talk about adaptation and why we should be hyper alert. I spoke about Michael Haig's four rules a couple of times. Here they are, and I've rephrased them. First of all, he says that most successful adaptations started from concepts that were already cinematic, that, that had this simple logline. When you talk about these movies, it sounds like, or the, the books or the underlying material, that whatever it is, a graphic novel or, a, or a, a, a poem, if you talk about it, it is as if you talk about a movie already. So when you, before you decide to adapt something, this is one exercise. Write the logline. Can you write the logline? It's probably going to be an easier task to make the adaptation. So most successful adaptations already start from successful cinematic concepts. Second one, we've repeated this a couple of times, your allegiance is to the movie, not to the underlying work. Michael Haig also says, avoid biographies that are based on lives that have a series of big events. Each of those big events could be a story in its own right. You are telling one story, one action in a movie, unless you're doing a TV series, obviously. So if you feel that you're having, you're having a biography about a sufficiently famous person, um, rather than trying to cram it all into a feature, it's probably better to do it as a series. And Netflix have proven over the past few years that that can be incredibly successful. You know, think about the... the the uh, biographies, well, they're actually not really biographies, but they, they talk about people like Donald Trump or um, uh, the Tiger King uh, or the, um, um, the Bhagwan. So uh, even there, often, even though it's serialized, they still choose a segment out of the life of these people that they highlight. In any case, you avoid serialized bios where you have a whole series of different stories. And then finally, he says, don't adapt your own work. So Michael Haig also has eight steps in terms of the process. And that, I think, is something we can adopt easily because you already understand these steps and this is already part of the process that you follow if you've taken my classes before. First of all, you want to make sure that you, you own the rights to the material you do, you're going to adapt. Otherwise, it may all be in vain. All your work may be for nothing. Then you build a step outline. If you don't know what is a step outline, go into our earlier masterclasses or uh, Google my name plus step outline and you may be able to download a free sample that you can use to fill in. In that step outline, you're going to find the outer motivation. What is the goal? What's the, the central conflict of this story. Um, most often there's going to be more than one. You need to pick one. And yes, you may have to let go of the others. And then you're going to do an exercise I always ask you to do when you build a step outline, identify events and actions. Now, in a good story, there is a close relationship between each event and, and uh, its corresponding action and vice versa. If you have an event that doesn't lead to an action, a visible action on the screen, it is a non-event. It should not be in your story. If you have an action that doesn't have a corresponding event, it means the action is not motivated. It comes out of nowhere. The audience won't understand your character. And this jumps us, uh, this puts us out of the film. So identify events and actions. Make sure there's a balance and there's also a relationship between them. This is arguably the single most important exercise in the whole process. 
and it's underrated. It's actually overlooked in, in film uh, writing uh, generally. Now you've identified these events and actions, now you're going to have to structure them dramatically. You're going to make sure that they are, um, as a, you know, basically what I just described, that relationship between events and actions, that is this five, making sure that there is that relationship, that um, there is drama, as in conflict, that whatever the character wants to achieve, there is an object, there's an obstacle in the material that you've uh, found. And then you may have to restructure it. You may have to reorganize it. You may have to throw things out, uh, bring things forward, or move things backward. And then um, finally, you're allowed to go back to the source. You can open that book again because you haven't consulted it. You have taken the, the Hitchcock approach all the, all the way up to this point. Now you're allowed to go back and bring in the detail. So now you've got a, a properly structured step outline that is a story that works in its own right. Now you can go back and flesh out that original story and bring the meat uh, to the bones of your new story. You'll find that there is, there's going to be gaps. There will be areas in the story that you don't have anything for. And this is where you're going to have to build new material from scratch. You're going to have to be the writer that you, you normally are when you're writing original material. You have to brainstorm and um, write scenes that are not present in the original work and that never happened in the real life of the character you're writing about. But it's part of the process. So Michael Hegg's eight steps. There you go. Let's look at a few cases in the book that I showed you here. Um, you'll find a short story called The Sentinel. The Sentinel is a story of, um, it's, it's sci-fi. So a group of scientists on the moon, they find something f from their telescopes, they see something listening, and they go there and they find this um, obelisk. If you've seen the movie 2001, you know what I'm talking about. There's this, um, actually there's a different, different name for it. I, I'm drawing a blank here. What do you call it? It's not a, is it an obelisk? Is that what, what, what they call them? In any case, they travel there and they look at it and they wonder where it may come from. And that's the end of the story. So it's a really simple, short story. Team on the moon, they see this item they go there and they wonder what it might be and they have some um, possible assumptions around it, but there's no resolution, there's no clear, conclusive ending to it. If you've seen the film, you know that there's a lot more to this film and this is only one of the chapters. I think it's the, the, second, of the, it's the second chapter in the film. So everything else in that film is invented around this particular uh, short story. So it's more inspired by I promised you I was going to talk about John Doe versus the short story that it's based on. And this is a lesson in what can you take from original source material and where do you have to do the work of adapting it and making it work for the screen. A Reputation was a short story written by, um, um, I think it's Richard Cornell. Connell, Richard Connell, I said yesterday. It's Richard Connell in the 1920s, published in a newspaper. It's a story of an unassuming man uh, who is a bit annoyed with the fact that nobody is interested in him. He goes to, this, to these society meetings and n never talks to anyone. Never, no one talks to him. No one even pays him any attention. And one night he's sitting at this table and something just takes hold of him, possesses him, and he blurts out this bizarre line. He says something along the lines of, um, well, I've made a decision that I might, on the 4th of July, I might kill myself by drowning myself in, the, in Central Park. And suddenly he, he gets everybody's attention, right? Everybody's listening now. And he kind of enjoys that attention. And he builds on that story, because where he absolutely had no intention of killing himself. He just said it, blurted out. Now he's going to live up to that. He's built himself a reputation. And that reputation grows, and more and more people are interested. He starts writing columns. He has to appear in radio shows. There are movements that are building around the country uh, because 
The reason he's going to commit suicide is because of the state of, the, of society. It's rotten. And things have to improve, and now people agree things have to improve. And this, so this movement, this grassroots movement, uh, 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 occurs all over the country. And things get out of control. And obviously, at the end, the day uh, uh, approaches, and he's got, a, you know, he's got this pressure. And in the original short story, he lives up to his promise and his reputation, and he does exactly what he promised to do. So that's an interesting, amusing story, but it wouldn't work as a film. Why? Two reasons. First of all, the, the dude is a bit bizarre. He, some might say he's an idiot for, for saying something. And then, you know, you, you can change your mind. And yes, why wouldn't you not uh, live on and try to, to, to make things better, particularly if you didn't mean those things, if you just blurted them out? Uh, what's more, and at this point, there is no other character personally invested in this particular uh, individual. So you have a, a, a main character and we follow his stream of consciousness, but no one else is really invested in his fate. And that's when Robert Riskin came in, screenwriter for Frank Capra, who made the movie um, in 1941, Meet John Doe. The film was completely reconceptualized around a female journalist, played by Barbara Stan uh, Stanwyck, who works for a newspaper that has to downsize and she's going to lose her job. And she comes up with this idea of faking a letter. And the letter is pretty much what the character in um, uh, Richard Connell's story said. The letter is, look, society is rotten and as protest, I'm going to commit suicide. She publishes the letter. It's an overnight success. Newspaper sells tons and is saved. A lot of people's jobs have been saved. Obviously, the competition is going to look into it and claims it's a fake. So now, a story is building. Can you see that? You have an individual, you have the female journalist who's made a commitment, and she now has to live up to this. So she has to make sure that this works. She now has to come up with a, a dude who is this John Doe who wrote this letter. So she goes out and recruits this character played by Gary Cooper. Uh, the character's name is John Willoughby in the movie. And, and his character in the film is down and out, needs the money, so he, he happily accepts uh, whatever he takes to, plays, to play that role. And then pretty much the story plays out that we know from the reputation, the, sh the short story, only that we have two characters who are, who are invested in this journey from a different perspective. This, the, the journalist who was dishonest, but, you know, to help everyone else in, at the newspaper, and it's successful, but... Obviously, there's going to have to be an end to the story. And then there's the, the um, down and out, but genuine character, the honest John Willoughby, who takes his money, but when things get out of control, he pulls out, he disappears. And you have a plot that becomes far more interesting than the original short story. Um, so I, I really invite you to, to read the short story with that in mind. You know, you, you read this short story, see where the potential is. Now, Obviously, in the, the story, the potential is that the idea that gets out of control. It's someone who's essentially a nobody who initiates a grassroots movement in the country, plays out in the U.S., for improvement, for, for betterment, to, to you know, make people more aware. And then there are other parties coming in to use this to their own benefit, and it becomes politicized and... And, and in that respect, it's a very modern story. If you were to read it, it feels very much like 2020. Similar, another film, and again based on a short story, is A Face in the Crowd. That's the Eli brilliant Elia Kazan film based on the short story, uh, An Arkansas Traveler. Um, again, another one I would recommend you check out, where the, the short story is a little bit closer to the film, but with a vastly different ending. So there, there are two interesting cases for you to study, and you pick your own. I mean, I'm not saying you should pick these. These are the ones that I used for the preparation of this particular class, and they're used in, that, in, in the book. Um, I have a few more books here that I wanted to show you. Did you know, by the way, Casablanca was not based on a novel nor a um, short story. It was based on a play. Everybody goes to Rick's. And then this is um, an anime series, three-part 
uh, anime, The Dreaming, by Sydney-based author Queenie Chan, who happens to also be a member of the Sydney Screenwriters Meetup. I tried adapting this together with um, a fellow writer, and it uh, seemed to be very difficult as a feature. It may be working better as a, um, as a novel. Clockwork Orange, one of my students yesterday made a documentary about Anthony Burgess, actually knew him, met with him, uh, I think it was the 1970s. Uh, this one you've seen, that's Kolkata Chromosome, one of my favorite films. Very, very difficult to adapt, I've looked at it several times. Another one difficult to adapt, people have tried several times. There are several, uh, a few adaptations of The Big Sleep, but Raymond Chandler is a tough one just because of his style and noir and detective stories as a rule are difficult because they're, they're based on mystery and they're very much about a character observing, taking in information, not so much acting. What a, what a detective does is not necessarily uh, very interesting. And that's what makes that genre such a challenge. This was a, a bigger success, let to write one in, horror film. And this is still ongoing, hugely successful, the series of graphic novels, The Boys, um, going on Amazon these days. You're probably familiar with Robert Ludlum and his Jason Bourne character. By the way, that, those were, were very loose adaptations. Basically, they just take the character and the character's um, job to spin new stories. And then you, you all know this one, the famous kids' Christmas story that became the action movie Die Hard, or vice versa. Now we're going to talk about this one. This is a Victorian romantic novel, Room with a View. Actually, not Victorian, it's 1908, so it's a bit past that, but it's maybe set in Victorian England, about Lucy Honeychurch a girl from the aristocracy who travels to Florence with her chaperone and there meets a man that she falls in love with while back at home she's engaged. And then she, she goes back and um, the wheels start coming off the relationship. And we're going to look at a scene from that novel. By the way, Ian Forster knows how to create anticipation and therefore his novels are eminently cinematic. So we're going to look at this particular scene. Both pages are actually from Cecil's point of view. It is Cecil's experience of this, this um, debacle, that is his first kiss with his fiancée. And this brings us to the scene from the film, A Room with a View by James Ivory, adapted by Ruth Projavala, and starring... Helena Bottom Carter as Lucy Honeychurch and Daniel Lear Lewis as Cecil Weiss. So here we go. Lucy? Hmm? Yes, I suppose we ought to be going. I want to ask you something that I have never asked before. What, Cecil? Yes? Up to now, I have never kissed you. No. You haven't. May I now? Well, of course you may, Cecil. You might before. I can't run at you, you know. Mother's right. Those people Charlotte and I met at the Pensione. They were, all of them, rather extraordinary. This is the solution to 
showing the character's inmost thoughts without having to describe them with voiceover. It is eminently cinematic. This is a, a purely cinematic device, a flashback. And it, it, it shows it in a way that the novel couldn't do. Because obviously, you know, novels don't show the images. We're going to finish with what I would consider the five essential rules. In the novel, the POV was very clearly that of Cecil Weiss. In the film, it is radically Lucy's point of view all through. So establish point of view. It's your first task. And I know, and you know, that's your task in any sort of, any screen drama you're writing, whether it be a, an original uh, script for the television or for film, you're going to establish POV anyway. But when you adapt, you may be misled by the original. So here you need to think, whose POV is the story from? In the case of A Room with a View, it is Lucy's story. Therefore, we need to stay with her at the most crucial moments. And this scene was a really good example. While in the novel, it, you get away with having a Cecil Weiss's perspective, you wouldn't in the movie. So it is, it's Lucy's POV. Next one, you're going to dramatize it. I mean, Forster's novels are pretty dramatic as they are, but not all are. And depending on the type of material you like, you may have to create more dramatic scenes. You're going to have to condense time. That's a given. We've talked about that. It was dog day afternoon. It was not dog day year or life. It is just one day in the life of these people. So condense time for the screen, even if the bigger story runs for much longer. A great uh, movie to analyze is Selma about the, the marches with Martin Luther King. Be true to the movie. Your allegiance is to the movie, not to the original work. And finally, activate the hero. And this goes back to heroes that in the original work reflect, observe, but don't act in the real world. They don't respond to events with external actions in your Adapted work in your screen drama, you must have heroes who act in the external world. Uh, world. So you need to come up with ways of um, showing the response to the events physically, create actions. Um, you mentioned earlier that one adaptation that we should not do is based, is use our own story. Uh, it was not really my rule. It was a rule uh, of, by Michael Haig. But obviously, I've brought it in here for a reason because I really I respect Michael Haig and, and he knows what he talks about. In this case, the reason he says, and he, he puts it quite strongly, he even says that people who have published their own literary work successfully, even they should not adapt their own work. Um, but writing about your own life story is, is a particular warning from his part because writing dramatically requires a certain distance and it's difficult as it is to kill your darlings. If you've lived the story, your connection with the material may prevent you from having that distance that allows you to, to cut what needs to be cut. It's, it's really random though. Um, when one of the first books that I loved as a child was the mixed up files of Mrs. Cecily and Franklin Wheeler. So it's like, it's really old school, but it really got me into reading and I loved it. And then the adaptation was so woeful. And <laughs> great stars in it. I think it was Lauren Bacall or someone who was in it. So oh. it's great things, but it just, it didn't work. Yeah, but you know, the, sometimes they just have to do it. I look at it like this, you know, when you have a, a hugely successful original property, there is money on the table and someone is going to take it. This was our class about adaptations. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please like it and um, subscribe to our channel. We have more masterclasses coming up. And if you want to know when they appear, then the only way will be to subscribe to this channel or to sign up for the master classes so you can attend them live. Just look at the description below the video and perhaps you can enroll for the next round, which starts in a few weeks. Thank you for watching. Hoping to see you next time. Bye-bye.